there was a major project and so they printed in TypeScript uh, the label and then just added in the date. But those situations are so rare and particularly rare in my collection that I'm not going to pay attention to that. But if I were at the Smithsonian or the American Museum, I might be thinking that some of those labels are very stereotyped and maybe I should handle those differently. You saw this when Kim was presenting on OCR that they could get a lot of the data, if not all of the data, and then just fill in the critical pieces. So, where are the data? In the University of Kansas Ornithology collections? Well, they're somewhere between the specimen tag, the collection catalog, which are those paper ledgers, and the field notes. And so I need to think about where to get the best quality information. Which data are the most accurate? Well, where were people annotating re-identifications, updates to data? Now, I overlap just enough, 11 months, with the last person from the previous generation in my collection. And I talked with her. And what she said was, you know, we never updated those paper ledgers. What we updated were the, the specimen tags. That's pretty common in ornithology. So right away I'm thinking as much as I can from specimen tags. Um, where were specimen removals, deaccessions, losses, things like that? Where were those noted? And in the case of the University of Kansas, they weren't. The newest ones were put in the, in the ledgers, but the first century of our collection, that information wasn't noted. Now luckily, our people didn't do a lot of trading. But if you were in an institution that was trading this, trading this, trading this, sometimes you end up digitizing specimens that you don't even know where they are. They may be lost, they may be at some other institution, but they're not in your institution. But we only found maybe, or we only didn't find maybe a hundred or so specimens that should have been there and didn't turn out to be there. Another question is which data sources are the most readable? I'll give you a, a funny example of that in a moment. But just to give you one example, my, one of my major professors was Scott M. Lanyon. And we had a scientist on staff, this is back at the Field Museum, a scientist on staff named Stephen M. Goodman. So SM are the first two letters in each person's initials. And the L for Lanyon kind of went like this. And the G for Goodman kind of went like this. And we got into worlds of problems because you really couldn't tell SML from SMG. Um, and then also, where do we have the possibility of error? For instance, Maybe the specimens are collected in a Spanish-speaking country, and then they come back to the University of Kansas, and some student or some technician is transcribing the data, but doesn't know Spanish. Well, there's a big potential for new errors to come in. So I'm thinking I probably want to stay as close to the specimen as possible. So my conclusion out of all of this for the University of Kansas bird collection is that I probably want to stick with the original data labels, the specimen tags. Here's that example of handwriting. This is that same graduate student who just finished his PhD and his handwriting is near perfect. It's about like typewriter script. And then this is my closest colleague, collections manager, who's infamous for bad handwriting. Yes, I'm saying that on YouTube. Um, to the point where I have watched him write a note to himself, and five minutes later... <laughs> okay, next thing to think about is feasibility. We've got to make this process efficient, because whatever we're going to do, 
we're going to do it 120,000 times. So we know that handling these specimens is awkward and time consuming, especially large specimens. I mean, we have specimens of ostriches that are a pelt that would go from here to the table. It takes two people to lift it so that you don't damage it. Um, so we really don't want to be handling the specimens much at all. We're going to have to handle them some. But what I'm thinking about here is the difference between picking up the specimen, label, label, type, label, type, label, type, label. I'm handling that specimen a lot. Versus pick up the specimen, take a picture, probably not a complex image, but just a picture to get the general form of that specimen, and then front side of label one, front side of la back side of label one, front side of label two, back side of label two, stop. Put it back in the tray and move on. That's what I'm guessing. So some of these aspects of the process we can do, we have to do hands-on. And other parts, we can do it based on electronic images. So, um, this is, these are the conclusions I've been giving you all along. I want to stick with the specimen tags, except for specimens and alcohol. There, I think the data are better in the ledgers. Um, the ledgers had transcription errors. They have incomplete data fields and inconsistent updates. So I want to use those as seldom as possible, but I'll probably use them for the pickles. So that's kind of my end strategy. Work from the specimens. It's going to be awkward. It's going to be slow, but it's best. Um, and then once we have the images, we'll capture the data post hoc from, uh, from the images. And we need the collection right there and available to us because many times we're going to go back to the specimen, go back to the ledgers, and we're going to check when something looks strange. So here's a workflow. We probably want to pre-curate, kind of scan through. Again, I'm the new curator at this uncomputerized collection. I'm going to go through the whole collection, tray by tray. I'm going to look for in insect damage. I'm going to look for fragile specimens that need to be stabilized. Because I don't want to have to stop and do this stuff when I'm taking pictures, right? I'll probably make sure that our taxonomic uh, determinations are all in order. A big difference, especially from insect collections, is that essentially everything in our collection is correctly identified at the outset. I can think of maybe two or three genera in the whole collection where we have a dozen specimens set aside as you know, to be determined to species. And those, those taxa, we generally just barcode them and tie them to um, better known specimens. But a bird collection better be completely identified. So I'm going to go through and I'm going to make sure that my, my species IDs are, are good. And then, again, I'm going to image. And basically, I'm just going to record what case it's in, what drawer it's in, the species, the number of images I took of it, and the images of the specimen and all its labels. So essentially, that is going to go into a skeleton database, to use Melissa's term. And I'm going to make sure I know exactly where all those images are so that I can link to the database, just the way John showed you the other day. I'm going to import this into a data capture platform. You've just seen presentations about three or four of these platforms. I'll then capture the data from the image in textual format. I'm not going to do it using OCR because almost all of our labels are handwritten. So I'm just going to capture it by hand. And then I'm going to go into a cycle 
where I probably want to publish the data, which is to say make the data available openly to the whole world as I'm collecting the data, as this step is completed. But I'm also going to be doing some cleanup and I'm going to be doing some georeferencing and I'm going to be flagging problem records or problem fields. Okay? And the end product is that my data are globally available. Now, Melissa mentioned this, I'll repeat it. The fact that this is a complex workflow should not be an excuse for not sharing the data immediately. I would get to right here and I'd put that out there, which is to say the only data I have are species, that's kind of it. That's the only thing that isn't internal to my collection. I just have the species. But I'm going to put those images out there. I get to this stage, and now I've got data. And my feeling would be, at the end of the first day of data capture, the very best thing I can do is put my data out there. Why? One, it's publicity. People see the activity. Two, perhaps most important, you can benefit from other people's work. So for example, in VertNet, no, in the project called VertNet, I hope you all noticed that our uh, project name was, was co-opted by the InvertNet people, right? Um, in the project VertNet, we've found a 20 or 30 percent overlap of collecting localities. Which is to say, if the University of Kansas has a specimen from Accra, Ghana, probably somebody else does. Or maybe somebody else does. And that's 20 or 30 percent fewer specimens where I have to do the georeferencing. So there are a huge set of benefits from getting to this stage even at the end of your first day of data capture. And then just some more general comments. I feel like you know, I could take this process that I've been illustrating for you to any vertebrate collection because they, we kind of do things similarly. But each collection presents some peculiarities. So for example, fish people, and some, to some degree herp people, will do what are called LOTS, L-O-T-S. And a lot is when you put out a trap or a net or something and you get 500 fish back or 500 tadpoles and you realize, oh God, there are three species in here, it's 100 of that species, 100 of that species, and 300 of this species. And you really don't want to tie a tag on each one of those. And so what you do is you throw them all in a jar and you put a tag on the jar. So now what we have is multiple individuals that are all cataloged together. And you can get into big trouble with that. Maybe there's a cryptic species in there. Maybe that entity that you just cataloged as one entity is actually two distinct biological lineages and you just didn't spot it. Okay? So at some point, think about John's persistent identifiers. At some point, you have to take one persistent identifier and split it into two. Those are not things we want to have to do. But lots are a way of managing large numbers of specimens of, of putatively identical entities. Same place, same time, same day, same trap. And so you manage them together. And that's a difference. I don't know of any bird specimens that are, ca that are cataloged as lots except for, can anybody guess it? I showed you some pictures of them. Two or three or four individuals of the same species. Eggs. And we do have parasitic birds who will dump an egg in another bird's nest, and so we could actually have the same problems in our egg collections. 
okay? But in general, birds and mammals, you catalog single individuals. We're going to go into the world of insects next where frequently collections are not cataloging single individuals. So I'll leave most of that comment to Christiane. So again, just because I've shown you my workflow for the University of Kansas doesn't mean that that's the best workflow for your vertebrate collection. So a really critical component of this process is learning about the collection. That is crucial. I can't say, if somebody out here has a bird collection to computerize, I can't say this is the best way to do it. What I will say is I need to come visit you. I need to talk to the old time collections people. You know, the guy who's sitting retired uh, in a rocking chair somewhere. I need to talk to him. I need to learn about the collection. Give me a week or a month and then we'll talk about the workflow. And so it means that there's quite a bit of investment of time before you start working. But it's thinking time, it's strategy time. So that's kind of a view of vertebrate collections. Uh, any questions about that? 